Welcome back. Remember last time I got a chance to talk about my favorite pharaoh, Sneferu? Well, there were three things I wanted to stress about him. If you remember, one was that he established artistic conventions that would last for a thousand years. The other was he made Egypt an international power, going off to the Sinai for turquoise, to Lebanon for cedar. But the most important was probably that he showed Egypt how to build the pyramids. He's the one who figured out how to build the first true pyramid. Now, today I want to talk about his kid, his son Khufu, who built the Great Pyramid at Giza. But let me say something about Khufu's name, first of all. He's also called Cheops. So when you hear about the Great Pyramid of Cheops, it's the same guy. His mama called him Khufu. That was his Egyptian name. But the Greeks called him Cheops. They corrupted his name. So Cheops and Khufu, it's the same pharaoh. Now, let me start by saying that he didn't just build a pyramid. He did other things, too. He also built a huge boat next to his pyramid, and I want to talk about that also. But let's start with the pyramid. Now, let me start by acting like a tour guide. Let me give you some statistics about the Great Pyramid of Giza. Now, Giza, of course, is a suburb of Cairo today. It's a plateau, right? And on it, Khufu, Cheops, decided to build his pyramid. It's the largest pyramid ever built. It's 480 feet high. Until the Eiffel Tower was built, it was the largest building on Earth. Its base is so large that it covers 13 and a half acres. It's made of two and a half million blocks of stone, and they average about two and a half tons each. An incredible, incredible monument. But let me emphasize something right from the beginning. It's not the kind of monument that required higher mathematics. It's not a high-tech monument. It required masses of labor, skills at social, social organization, getting people together to build it. But it didn't require higher mathematics. Now, there are an awful lot of myths about the pyramid, the Great Pyramid, its magical properties, uh, people who've had strange experiences inside it. Let me say a few words about that right from the beginning. First, we know the purpose of the Great Pyramid of Giza. It was a tomb for the burial of the pharaoh. No question about it. Now, the difference, remember, between a tomb and a temple is a tomb is a place of burial, a temple is a place of worship. This was a tomb. Now, you hear many stories about the magical properties of a pyramid. For example, I'm sure you've heard that you can put a razor blade inside a pyramid shape and if it's dull, it'll become sharpened. Or that if you put food inside a small pyramid shape, that the food won't decay as quickly if it were outside. All of these stories about the magical properties of the pyramid are silly. Think about what we've learned in the last two lectures about how a pyramid developed. The Egyptians would have thought it was silly. There was no magical significance to the pyramid shape for the ancient Egyptians. Let's think about how it developed. Remember prehistoric times we had our sand pit burials? They eventually developed into rock cut burials. You go into the bedrock so the sand won't blow away and reveal the body. Then at some point somebody had the idea of building a little structure on top of that, a mastaba, a bench-like structure. And then when we get to the third dynasty, Imhotep, the architect of Zasser, had the idea of putting a mastaba on top of a mastaba, and then they enlarged it and put a few more mastabas, giving you this wedding cake effect, the step pyramid at Saqqara. Then comes Sneferu, my man. And he had the idea of filling in the steps and getting the first true pyramid. The point I want to make is the pyramid shape was an architectural development almost an afterthought, almost an accident of the way pyramid, the way tomb building was going. No one sat down and said, ooh, this has a magical shape, let's build a pyramid. It developed, it evolved. So this razor sharpening, the, you know, the, the magical properties of the pyramid, people sleep under pyramids, it would have even been silly to the ancient Egyptians. Now, with that said, let me go on to some other stories about the pyramid, and then I'm going to show you how it was built. I want to go in detail and give you 
a step-by-step -step description of how the Great Pyramid was built. But let me just say one thing about Napoleon inside the Great Pyramid first. You'll remember from a much earlier lecture when I talked about the origins of Egyptology that Napoleon's expedition to Egypt in 1798 was the beginning of Egyptology. And if you'll remember, Bonaparte was a bit of a scholar, a mathematician of sorts, a member of the French Institute in the Division of Mathematics, and he did indeed visit the Great Pyramid when he was in Egypt. Now, he visited it with some of his men, and he did not climb to the top of the Great Pyramid. It's possible to do that. It's now, it's illegal, you need special permission, but it's possible. It's like going up a giant staircase. While his men were climbing to the top, Napoleon walked around it, and he made a mental calculation. He was good at math, there's no doubt about it. And the calculation that he did was, he tried to figure out, given all the stones, he came to the conclusion you could build a wall around the world, you know, that kind of calculation. He loved to do that. But the interesting story is he went inside the Great Pyramid. He went inside. Now, he went in with a, an entourage, several people, and went to the burial chamber. And I'll be talking about the burial chamber later. And eventually he asked if he could be left alone inside the burial chamber. They left him alone. And then he came out, and he looked kind of white when he came out, ashen. And one of his officers said, are you OK? What happened? And Bonaparte said, and this is the story that's been repeated down, down the ages, said, never mind, you wouldn't believe me, and left. And he never spoke about it. When he was on St. Helena, you know, he was exiled to St. Helena, he was talking to one of his men, and, he, and the man said, he was about to tell me about it, but he said, no, and never did it. So we really don't know what happened with Napoleon inside the Great Pyramid. Maybe he had some mystical vision, and maybe nothing happened, and he just wanted to kind of create part of his legend. But there are plenty of legends associated with the Great Pyramid that just aren't true. Let me start with what Herodotus tells us about it, our Greek tourist who went to Egypt around 450 BC and saw everything and wrote down everything. Now, if you remember one thing he said about the Great Pyramid, we, which were certain wasn't true, that inscribed on the outside of the Great Pyramid were the onions and bread, the amount of food that was needed to feed the workmen. That's certainly not true. Nobody's going to put that on his pyramid. But what Herodotus does tell us about the building of the pyramid, and this is interesting, he says, now he was told this, of course, and remember, he's there in 450 BC. Pyramids are almost 2,000 years old. He was told that it took 90,000 men working on the pyramid at the same time to build it, right? And it's 90,000 men working. They work, they work three months at a time, it seems. Now, what I think is this. Did they work in shifts, you know, a few months at a time? What happened? Well, the 90,000 men is an interesting figure. And the three months at a time, I think, is interesting. What probably happened, and this is a theory that I think may be the good theory, the pyramids, of course, were built with free labor. No slaves. The exodus, when we have all the Israelites in Egypt, is much later. There were never a large number of slaves in Egypt that were used for work projects. Never. You ever watch those, those movies where you see the pyramids being built and you've got the slaves hauling on the blocks and you've got one guy with a whip whipping the slaves, pulling the block? Didn't you ever wonder why the slaves don't just grab this guy and beat him up? There was no weapon in ancient Egypt that gave anybody a great advantage over a large number of people. It would be very difficult to control thousands of slaves. We know for a fact that the Great Pyramid of Egypt was built by free labor. We have inscriptions by the work gangs that worked on the pyramid, which says Khufu's gang did great work, things like that. So it was built by free labor, and Herodotus says 90,000 men worked on it in a few months at a time. Now, what I think he means is this. Egypt was mainly agrarian. Practically everybody was a farmer. Now remember that the Nile overflowed its banks each year. And one of the seasons in Egypt was called inundation, when the land was inundated with the water. What that meant was there was time when the fields were underwater. You couldn't do anything. Then you had a large workforce that you could marshal 
to work on the pyramid. So I think during inundation, you had maybe 90,000 men working on it at one time. You got the farmers, unskilled labor, everybody pulling together to build this pyramid. That's probably what Herodotus means. He says something also that's very interesting about the pyramid. He says it was built with machines. Now, of course, this is 450 BC. What does he mean by a machine? One possibility is levers. Levers. The Egyptians, to this day, have a, have a device called a shaduf. A shaduf, they use it for raising water from the Nile to the fields. What it is, it's a long pole, and at one end, it's got a weight. At the other end is the bucket. So the bucket goes down, and then the weight pulls the bucket up with the water in it, and you dump it into the field. And this you can do, you can lift things rather easily. It's a kind of lever and fulcrum system. That's what the Egyptians may have had. What some people have suggested is that they had these levers, these shadouf, so to speak, on each level of the pyramid as they were lifting blocks up, up, and up. And that's what, what Herodotus may have meant when he said they had machines. But he gives us one of the very few ancient accounts of building anything. For some reason, the ancient Egyptians never wrote down how they built the pyramid. We have no papyrus at all that gives us a clue to how they built the pyramid. Now, I don't mean it's only pyramids that they didn't write down. We have no architectural papyri at all. Think about all the buildings that the Egyptians did, and they never wrote down how to build a temple, how to build a pyramid. Never. It may have been a kind of secret among the architects that they didn't want trade secrets to go out. There were other things they didn't write down. For example, they mummified people for thousands of years, but there's no papyrus that tells us how to mummify a person. So these are trade secrets. So if we're going to figure out how the pyramid was built, we have to sort of just look at it and think. And that's what we'll do. Now, first, when you go on the Giza Plateau, there are two pyramids that are actually look very similar. It's hard to tell which is the Great Pyramid. One was built by Khufu. That's the one we call the Great Pyramid. That's the tallest one. But there's another pyramid that's only 20 feet shorter, built by a, a successor, Kephren, as he's called by the Greeks. And the way you can tell them apart is the one that is not the Great Pyramid still has some of its white limestone casing at the very top. At the very top, it's got a little bit of frosting at the top at the peak. That's how you can tell that that's not the Great Pyramid. Most of that fine white limestone casing was pulled down in the Middle Ages to build the mosques of Cairo. So if you want to see the really fine white limestone casing of the, of the Great Pyramid, go to the mosques of Cairo. It's called Tura limestone. It came from the Tura quarries. Now, how do you build a pyramid? Right. First, as you know from last lecture, you don't build a pyramid on sand. Sand is unstable. It shifts. It moves. You clear down to bedrock. And then what you have to do is level the bedrock. You want it perfectly level. Now, how do you level an area? 13 and a half acres. Right? The base is 13 and a half acres. The prevailing theory is that you use basically something like a carpenter's bubble. You know the carpenter's bubble that they use, they put on top of a bookshelf and you can see if it's level when the bubble is showing. What they probably did is within those 13 acres, the base, that square base, 13 and a half acres, they dug channels. And in the channels, they filled it with water. Now, wherever the water would run out, you know that that's lower than the rest of the base. So you keep leveling, digging channels, leveling, till the water is pretty much stays in then you know you've got a level base, like a carpenter's. And it's very level, by the way. There have been very careful surveys done recently of the Great Pyramid's base. And you want to know how level it is? Now, 13 and a half acres, from one corner to the other, it never varies by more than two inches, over 13 and a half acres. That's precision. But let me emphasize, it's precision. It's great workmanship. It's not high tech. You don't need higher mathematics to build a pyramid. Well, we've got the foundation leveled. What can we say about the inside of the pyramid? Well, how do you bring all these blocks to the site? First of all, you don't have to bring a lot of them to the site. The quarries were right around the pyramid. Most of the quarries, and you can to this day, 
Walk around the pyramid and see the quarries. You can see places where stones were pulled out. So a lot of the stonework in the pyramid comes from right around. It saves transportation costs. You don't have to transport so many blocks. The very finest limestone for the casing, for that smooth outer surface, that came from a little bit of ways. It was floated across the Nile and then hauled into place. Now, the inside of the Great Pyramid is a marvel. It really is. There's, there, by the way, there are two entrances. If you, if you go to the Great Pyramid, you'll see that there are really two entrances. One entrance is a thieves entrance. The pyramid's entrance was covered over with the white limestone, right? Nobody knew where the entrance was, even in ancient times. In the ninth century, the Caliph al mamun and we hear about him in the Thousand and One Nights, the Arabian Tales, we hear about him and it says that he wanted to rob the Great Pyramid but didn't know where the entrance was. So we put workmen chiseling away at the, at the outside of the pyramid. And they kept chiseling and chiseling and nothing happened. And eventually they tried to do, do it faster. And what they did was they took fires. They built fires on the pyramid and doused it with cold water and cracking the stones. They kept removing stones, removing more stones. They were about to give up when one of the workmen heard a sound inside of a stone falling. So they knew they had hit a hollow chamber. And according to the Thousand and One Nights, they went in and they found not much treasure, just enough treasure to pay the workmen. It's, of course, a story, but probably it is true that in the ninth century, they did indeed, or around there, they did indeed enter the Great Pyramid. That is the entrance, by the way, the robber, the, the, the ninth century robber's entrance that tourists go into today. You don't go into the original entrance. That's higher up. Uh, that's sealed off. But that's the way that the tourists now go in through where the robbers went in. Now, what's it like inside the pyramid? Well, the pyramid underwent changes as it was being built. There were changes in the plan. Originally, originally, there was going to be a below-ground burial. There's, a, there's an unfinished pit. It goes down, it's a big chamber beneath the ground, unfinished. You can still see the rock, the bedrock, the crude bedrock, unfinished. Khufu's burial was above ground, way up in the pyramid, way up. Now, how do you get that high up? Well, there's a remarkable, remarkable passageway to get to the, the burial chamber. It's called the Grand Gallery. It's, it's a room that is still being debated as to what was it used for. It's 28 feet high. It's narrow. It's corbelled roofs again, remember? Sneffer is the one who figures out to use a corbelled roof. 28 feet high, maybe 10 feet wide, perhaps? And it goes all the way up the pyramid, inside. Nobody knows exactly why it was built. Some people think that they stored blocks in that grand gallery that were going to be slid down and seal the entranceway. Because there are large granite blocks that were slid down and plugged the entranceway. But you go up this grand gallery, and then you come to the burial chamber. Now, there are a couple of puzzles about the burial chamber. One, inside the burial chamber, is the sarcophagus, the stone sarcophagus of Khufu, the only thing ever found inside the burial chamber. It once had a lid that slid. We can tell that from the sarcophagus, but that's all that's there. No body was found, no inscription in the burial chamber, right? But that sarcophagus is about two inches wider than the doorway that leads to the burial chamber. It's one piece of stone, the sarcophagus but it's two inches wider than the doorway. Now, what that means is they put the sarcophagus in the burial chamber before the pyramid was complete. It was probably an attempt to avoid tomb robbing, that the robbers couldn't drag the sarcophagus out. So they put it in, and then they built the chamber around it. Now, the other interesting thing about the burial chamber is the ceiling. You remember that Sneferu, Khufu's father, Solve the problem of the roof. How do you build a roof that doesn't crack with the weight of the pyramid above it? By corbeling. Steps going inward, 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 all the way to the top of the ceiling. When you go into this burial chamber, there's no corbeling. It's big slabs of granite going across the top. Now, how come they don't crack? It's got the weight of the pyramid above it. Well, Khufu took it one further. He has an interesting solution to the problem. It's relieving chambers. 
if you could get in, and I've done it, it it's not easy. There's a, you have to cl crawl in through a hole outside. If you can get above the burial chamber, there's a tiny chamber called the relieving chamber. It's really small. I had to crouch. You can't stand up. You can't even bend over. You really have to kind of crawl in and crouch. It's a chamber that's only about, maybe must be four feet high. And that takes some of the pressure off the ceiling. And above that is another relieving chamber, and above that's another relieving chamber. And all the way at the top of that, above the relieving chambers, are two huge blocks of stone forming a triangle, an inverted triangle, like a pyramid sort of. That takes the pressure off the relieving chambers. So all the force of the weight above the pyramid is distributed through the pyramid away from the ceiling. It's a little bit like a corbelled step ceiling, only smoothed out into the form of this inverted V, a triangle. So the relieving chamber solves the problem of the weight weighting down on the ceiling of the burial chamber so it doesn't collapse. Right? Now, there's some very interesting questions about the Great Pyramid. How do you get the stones all the way up to the top? You know, it's too steep to pull up a pyramid. How do you do that? A stone weighing maybe three tons. There are two theories. One theory is the ramp theory, that you build a long ramp and the stones are hauled up the ramp and once you finish the pyramid, you remove the ramp. Now, for something the size of the Great Pyramid, to build, you know, you're going 480 feet up in the air, the ramp would have to be more than a quarter of a mile long. The ramp would be a major engineering project. But we do know they used ramps because at Karnak Temple, against one of the walls, is a mud brick ramp that they used to get blocks up. So maybe they used that technique. The other possibility is what we call a switchback. It's, you know how when you go up a mountain road, your, your, your car is corkscrewing up the road? It doesn't go straight up the mountain. It goes around and around and around. That's the technique they may have used for getting the blocks up to the top. They may have had the equivalent of a switch block road sort of corkscrewing up around the pyramid until you get the blocks up and then you start filling in. There are two theories. We don't know really which for sure. But the point I want to make is it didn't take higher mathematics to do this. It takes careful measurement. For example, another careful measurement. The sides of the Great Pyramid are perfectly aligned on the four compass points, north, south, east, west. Egyptians knew how to do that by careful observation of the stars. They could do that with the North Star. So you could do that. All of this required great workmanship, but not high-tech stuff. For example, some of the limestone casing blocks are still in place. You cannot fit a piece of paper between them. They are so perfectly fitted. That's remarkable. It's wonderful craftsmanship, especially on something that large. And think about it. All that was done within 22 years, the reign of Khufu, a remarkable achievement. Also, but I think the amazing achievement is the social organization. You had to have men at the quarries, quarrying. You had to have shipping guys. You had to have guys polishing stones, all of that, coordinating everybody to work on it. That's amazing. I mean, especially if you compare it with our society. How often do we undertake a project that we say, well, it'll take 20 years, but let's see how it goes? Not very often. That's why you can do great things if you have a pharaoh, a god on earth with absolute power. But that's the Great Pyramid of Giza. Now, let me say something about the second thing that I said that Khufu Cheops achieved, the boat. In 1955, I think it was, 54, probably 54, December 54, a boat was found buried near the Great Pyramid. Now, it was buried in a pit, in a pit dug into the bedrock, right? a big pit, 170-foot pit, buried into the bedrock, covered over with limestone blocks, so it was hidden, and it was discovered in 1954. The boat was dismantled. It was like a kit. It wasn't complete, but it was virtually com complete in all its pieces, 1,500 pieces. It took more than a decade to reassemble the boat. The wood was still in good enough condition, containing enough moisture the pit had been virtually airtight, that it still held its moisture, the wood was not brittle, and the entire boat could be reconstructed. 
took more than a decade. You can see it today. It's in the Bolt Museum right next to the Great Pyramid. It's in a glass museum. And there are some questions about this boat. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's, it's absolutely spectacular. It has huge oars, beautiful, graceful lines. It's 150 feet long. It's a big boat and made of cedars of Lebanon, the cedars that Sneferu brought back from his trading expeditions. But there are a couple of questions about this boat. What was it used for? For example, it has no mast. There's no place for a mast for a sail. So it wasn't really a sailing vessel. Now the oars don't look like they could really function properly. And I was wondering about the boat. I was really curious about this boat. I wanted to know, what is it used for? And one of my students, who is a wonderful model carver, one of the best model carvers probably in the world, and he worked on this with his father, he carved a test model of this boat. Now remember, Hufu is also called Cheops. Usually when the boat is referred to, it's called the Cheops boat. But don't get confused, it's the same pharaoh. He carved the model of the Cheops boat, seven feet. It's a pretty big model, but to the exact lines. And we tested this boat at the Webb Institute for Naval Architecture. They have a large test tank. Before you build a big ship, you do a test tank, you know, test it in a tank. And we built this little model, seven feet, and put it in the water. Now, hooked up to the boat are various electrodes feeding data back to the computers. And we simulated all kinds of conditions. Nile conditions, Mediterranean conditions. We could do it with waves. We could do it with pitch. We could see what, see what it would do. We wanted to see what was this boat used for? What were its properties? Now, first, we know it didn't sail because there was no place for a mast. That we know. But what we found out was, first, it had wonderful river properties. It, it glides through the water beautifully. All the naval architects at the Institute said, it's beautiful. It's elegant. They were really impressed. But one of the analyses showed that the oars could not possibly propel a boat that size. It didn't have a mast, so the wind didn't propel it. The oars couldn't propel a boat that big. What was it used for? Now, there are two possibilities. One is that it's a symbolic boat. It's a ritual boat that was supposed to take the pharaoh to the next world. Now remember, for the long haul, you went by boat any time you went a great distance, and the pharaoh was going to go to the next world, which was in the west, across the sky. And this could have been the boat that was going to take Snef Sneferu's son, Hufu, to the next world. The other possibility, and it's the one that I tend to favor, is that the boat was used, but only once. It was the boat that took Sneferu on his last journey, that took him from the east bank of the Nile, which is where the living stayed, to the west bank, which is where the pyramids and the dead were buried. This may have been a boat that was a barge that was towed across the Nile with Khufu's body on it, with Cheops' mummy, and once on the other side of the Nile, the mummy was placed inside the Great Pyramid. The boat was disassembled, placed in the pit, where it remained for nearly 5,000 years. There's an interesting construction technique about this boat. It's not nailed together. The Egyptians didn't have nails. When they had to do something with, with wood, they pegged it. But this boat isn't pegged either. It's what we call a sewn boat. The planks in the boat, and some are 70 feet long, are tied together. But it's still river-worthy. What would happen is that the wood would swell. The ropes would shrink, and making it watertight. Now, my project that I'm working on right now is to construct a full-scale replica of the boat, a 154-foot boat, made in the exact Egyptian way, and put it on the Nile to see just what it could do. The problem right now is to find cedars of Lebanon large enough to get the timber. But we hope to learn a lot. I'll see you next time.